Thus far, our discussion of allele frequencies and the processes that change them have all assumed that organisms with different genotypes are equally fit. That is, they are equally likely to pass on their alleles to offspring. But of course, we know that that's not the case. In extreme cases, a genotype can be lethal to an embryo or a juvenile, and the offspring may simply not be able to reproduce at all. However, as we'll see, even modest increases or decreases in an organism's fitness can have dramatic impacts on the overall frequency distribution of alleles in a population. Before we can start trying to ask those kinds of questions, though, we need a quantitative way to assess fitness. And so, we'll begin so by defining relative fitness as the relative likelihood that one genotype will contribute its alleles to the next generation. And so, we usually say that the most fit genotype has a fitness of 1. For example, let's say that a genotype AA has a fitness of 1.0, and the genotype little a little a has a fitness of 0 0.96. And we usually uh, we usually represent the fitness of a particular genotype as W. And so um, it's also useful to ask how disfavored is one genotype compared to another. And so in this particular example, the little a little a genotype produces 4% fewer offspring on average than a big A big A genotype, and we call this the selection coefficient against little a, little a. And in this case, it's 4%. And we usually will represent this selection coefficient with the letter S. And so, for this little a, little a genotype, Compared to big A, big A, its fitness is 0 0.96, and the selection coefficient is 0 0.04. And we can use these ideas to predict how the proportions of genotypes will change over time. Remember that we're defining the fitness of a particular genotype as its relative ability to produce offspring. And so, the proportion of genotypes, big, uh, the, pro the proportion of big A, big A genotypes compared to little a, little a genotypes in the next generation is the proportion of big A, big A genotypes compared to little a, little a genotypes in this generation times the relative fitness. And so we can write that out like this, right? So the frequency of big A, big A in generation n plus 1 relative to the frequency of little a, little a in generation n plus 1 is the frequency of big A, big A in this generation compared to the frequency of little a, little a in this generation times the fitness of big A, big A relative to the fitness of little a, little a. And of course, in this particular example, the highest fitness here is always simply 1. And if you want to look n generations out, right, then you simply repeat this process n times. And so, the frequency at generation n of the homozygote uh, big A compared to the homozygote dominant, I mean, compared to the homozygote little, little a, make sure I get this right, 
is the frequency at generation zero of one compared to the other times the fitness of one compared to the fitness of the other to the nth power, right? We're just repeating this process n times for the n generations that we want to model. And when you look at this graphically, what you see is that no matter where on this plot things start, the frequency of the little a, little a genotype, because it is less fit than the big A, big A genotype, always decreases and approaches zero asymptotically, right? And so that raises the question, why are there so, why are there, why are rare, seriously deleterious alleles, like for example, the ones that cause autosomal recessive diseases like cystic fibrosis. Why are those rare alleles still around? If this plot shows that the, um, shows that the frequency of the uh, homozygous recessive genotype decreases down to zero. Well, there are two reasons. The first is that usually the selection in this case only applies to the homozygous recessive. Right? Did you notice how I haven't mentioned heterozygotes in any of this yet? Right? In a disease like cystic fibrosis, a heterozygous carrier has no fitness disadvantage. Right? And so if we pop them in right here, their fitness is still one. Right? And then if you think back to Hardy Weinberg, most of these deleterious alleles are present in heterozygotes, not in homozygotes, where they can be selected against, right? Because selection only acts in this particular case on the homozygote, selection against the recessive allele, and thus the change in the allele's frequency is very slow when the, when the recessive allele is rare. And the second reason, the second reason that deleterious alleles stick around is because they also arise spontaneously via mutation. The balance between mutation on one hand and selection on the other is our next topic.